Our next speaker, Dr. Glenn McDonald, is, is from the School of Agriculture, Food and Wine at Adelaide Uni. He's a graduate of the University of Sydney and has worked in irrigated and rain-fed cropping systems in New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia. His interests include crop physiology, plant nutrition and agronomy, and recent work has focused on nutritional problems of alkaline and sodic soils. The work has included programs, this work has included programs, I'm sorry, to quantify the relative importance of different subsoil constraints to variety adaptation in wheat, improving salinity, tolerance in bread wheat, studies on sodium and chloride toxi uh, toxicity in barley and faba beans, and investigating the role of zinc tolerance uh, and zinc in heat tolerance, I beg your pardon. He is currently is involved in research into improving phosphorus use efficiency in wheat and barley. Can we make him welcome? Dr. Glenn McDonald. Uh, yeah, thank you and thank you for the invitation to speak to you this afternoon. I realise I'm in, on a dog watch and standing between you and happy hour, so I'll try to keep it as uh, entertaining and as uh, painless as possible. I guess I was asked to talk a little about micronutrient nutrition and specifically how that fits into aspects of conservation tillage. So what I want to do is uh, cover two aspects. I want to look at basically some of the principles behind plant nutrition in a more general sense and specifically micronutrient nutrition and then look at some of the uh, effects of changes in cultivation and uh, residue uh, management on the availability of those nutrients. And then finally, I would like to talk about some of the interactions that may occur with micronutrient nutrition in farming systems. So, to start off with, if we go back to the basics and we just look at nutrient cycling in a, in a farming system, the important thing to recognise is plants can only take up nutrients from moist soil. So, the nutrients in the soil solution are the primary or the, are the main source of direct uptake of nutrients from the soil. Those nutrients in the soil solution may only represent a very small proportion of the total nutrients in the, in the soil. And essentially what you have is an equilibrium between the nutrients in that soil solution, the nutrients in the clay and the mineral complexes, which is largely related to the soil texture, and then the nutrients in the organic matter fraction. And so the biological activity and the building up of organic matter becomes an important management tool in terms of nutrient management. So although we often talk about residue retention and stubble management in terms of soil structure and soil water, it actually is a key aspect of nutrient management in farming systems because it can provide a significant pool of nutrients. The other thing is that you can lose nutrients from that system either from plant uptake and removal of products and uh, obviously that's uh, an inevitable feature of farming systems, but also you can lose it as erosion and through leaching. Now you probably all realise that the cropping system you have can affect most components of that system. So erosion, leaching, um, the amount of organic matter cycling, uh, let's see, the amount of cycling in the system, they can all be affected by the type of tillage and farming practices which are, are, which are occurring. The other thing to remember is that when you add fertiliser, although it may solubilise and go into soil solution, most, a lot of it is actually incorporated into the organic matter or into the clay and mineral complexes. And in particular soil types, uh, some of that uh, fertiliser uh, may be made available slowly over a longer period of time, but some of it is actually made unavailable. So, for example, in, in South Australia, on some of the highly calcareous soils that you find in parts of the Air Peninsula, the amounts of calcium carbonate in those soils actually binds up a lot of the phosphorus in the soil. And even though you have a soil test which shows you have adequate amounts of phosphorus, you can still have phosphorus deficiency developing within the plants. What that illustrates is there's an important difference between the total amount of nutrients in the soil and the availability of those nutrients in the soil and plants will respond to the availability of the nutrients in the soil. Those nutrients which are in that soil solution and which can be taken up. That availability is affected by pH. It's also affected by environmental factors such as how much water is in the soil. 
So the availability declines under very dry conditions and conversely it declines under very wet conditions. So there's an optimum set of soil conditions which improves the availability of those nutrients. And also the microbial activity of the soil and the uh, equilibrium between the release and the uptake of nutrients from that organic matter is also going to be important. Um, the ability to improve organic matter is going to be limited by basically how much crop residue you can produce. So in highly productive systems, in high rainfall areas, the potential to improve organic matter, organic matter is going to be greater than in low rainfall environments with sandy soil. So there will be an inherent limitation uh, in those circumstances. The other thing is that the nutrient requirements of plants varies through the growing season. So crops go through an initial vegetative phase, about the uh, four to five leaf stage, they then become reproductive, and then obviously at, uh, at flowering they, they set their grain, they go into grain fill. So, but the important thing about uh, yield development is that there's a fairly narrow window through which the bulk of the yield potential of the crop is developed. And this corresponds to the period from flag leaf emergence through the beginning of grain set. In that four to five week period, three to week, three week period in some cases, uh, the yield potential of the crop is largely determined because that's when that developing ears are growing most rapidly and that's where its demand for resources is greatest. So maintaining a healthy uh, crop and maintaining a high nutrient supply during that phase of growth is actually critical to developing the yield potential of the crop. If we look at the relative uptake of nutrients through the growing season, uh, what you find is that the initial uptake of nutrients is relatively greater early in the growing season compared to dry matter. So you can see here, here's the dry matter production over the course of the growing season, and we see that we've got relatively more uptake of NP and zinc early in the growing season uh, compared to dry matter. And so what this emphasises is that you need to have good nutrition early in the season to allow that to occur. But the other thing is that you can see that the peak demand for nutrient, the greatest demand for nutrient, basically corresponds to the greatest demand for, uh, for or the greatest increase in crop growth. So the greater the demand for growth, the greater the demand for nutrients. And for a, the general principle is that if you need to have a, a well-nourished crop, you need to have a system which is able to supply the nutrients during that rapid phase of growth to maintain the growth, to provide the photosynthesis, which will then feed the ear during that critical phase of development. The other thing is that in the dry land cropping systems of Australia, um, most of the nutrients are taken up prior to anthesis. In uh, the low to medium rainfall areas, generally the soil dries out, the root activity starts to decline, and so the uptake during grain filling is very low, if not negligible. And so the nutrient levels within the grain need to come from the remobilisation of nutrients which are taken up prior to flowering. Given appropriate conditions, plants do have the capacity to take up nutrients during grain filling, but in many of the farming systems, uh, the soils are generally too dry to allow that to, uh, to occur to a significant extent. The other principle is how plants respond to nutrients, and we can define this by a nutrient response curve. And generally what we can do, we can do this either in pots or we can do it in the field, but here's just an example from a pot experiment. We grow plants under different levels of nutrition from severely deficient to very high levels. We measure the nutrient concentration in the plant and relate that to either the growth or the yield. And the general response